hello, I am Renny. Okay, Tegan, you know what? I've tried this intro like three times. We're just gonna go with it, okay? Hi, I'm Renny. My pronouns are they, them. And this is Renny Reads. Um, here on my channel we talk about queer books, fan fiction, human rights, and just about everything in between. This is a channel where we have blue hair and pronouns, so if that bothers you, feel free to click away. So, today we're going to be talking about a book called The Miseducation of Cameron Post, which was written by Emily M. Danforth in 2012. There was also a film adaption of it made in 2018, but I haven't watched it. I tend to not like the movies that are made about books, so um, I'm not gonna watch it. Feel free to watch it. You feel free to read the book and then watch it and then tell me if it's any good. I hope it is, because <laughs> the book is incredible. Okay, starting off, some trigger warnings. This is a very heavy book. It was kind of written in the era of the same like John Green. I would liken the tone to kind of looking for Alaska. Also, um, I want to be your Joey Ramone. I'm not sure who that was written by. It's on my bookshelf, but I don't really want to go grab it. But the tone is kind of the same. It does deal with very heavy topics, such as... I'm gonna have Tegan put them on the screen for you. Homophobia, religious abuse, conversion therapy, transphobia, character death, and self-harm. Like I said, if that's not your thing, t click away. Honestly, take care of yourself. You know better than I do what you can handle. So please, don't put yourself at risk for my sake. <laughs> anyway, let's get into it. So the miseducation of Cameron Post starts in a small town in Montana. If you see me looking over here, I have a script written with everything, because if I don't, I will just go on tangents forever, and I don't think you want to be here for 10 years. It goes... Yeah, it starts in Miles City, Montana, which is a small conservative farming town. So everything is like out in the boonies. There's not a lot of people. It's very small town oriented. Cam is 12 years old. Cameron Post is the main character. Uh, she goes by Cam, so I'm gonna probably refer to her a lot more as Cam, but she is 12 years old when the book starts, and it starts off with her in the summer, right before she starts middle school, and she's hanging out with her best friend Irene. They're doing the normal kid stuff, they're running around town, uh, going to the public pool, eating popsicles more than they probably should. It goes on, they're hanging out in Irene's parents' barn, and they're hanging out, they're doing girl things, and Irene kisses Cam. And that just kind of sets the whole tone for our book of just immediate gay crisis, which I can completely understand. <laughs> um, she spends a lot of time in the beginning of the book kind of convincing herself it's just what girls do. You know, they're going into middle school, so they have to practice kissing for their future boyfriends, which is very relatable. I can admit I probably did the same thing a couple of times. <laughs> Unfortunately, immediately after that happens, they kind of don't talk about it. They kind of go on with their day. And that night when they go to bed, Cam gets news from Irene's parents that her own parents have died in a car accident on the way home from a camping trip. And just then, like, the tone shifts from the book rapidly. Like, this author is incredible at doing tone shifts. She just kind of goes from one thing to the next and it just it hits you. It's very heavy. It's not graphic, but her emotions towards it are very real. The author does a very good job of making you feel the same things that Cam was feeling. I had to put it down a couple of times, but it was really good uh, to read it through. So right after that, her grandma came down for the summer for that trip as well to just kind of oversee her. And right after that happens, her grandma sells her property, uh, moves completely in with Cam, as well as her Aunt Ruth sells her little condo in Florida and moves into goddamn middle of nowhere, Montana. And she stays with them. And immediately you can kind of tell that Cam does not like her. It's I don't know. I didn't really like her. I have just personally family members who are a lot like her. She's a born again Christian, which if you are religious, no harm, no foul, no nothing. Um, I am ex-religious myself. I have a lot of very complicated feelings about it. As long as you are not weaponizing your Christianity as it is used in the book here, I have no problem with you. But yeah, she is the type of Christian though who will weaponize her Christianity against Cam later on. Um, and this is shown when she comes in and the first thing she wants to do constantly is just pray with Cam and Cam expresses to her multiple times like she doesn't really care. That's not really something that brings her comfort. She is glad that that brings her Aunt Ruth comfort because she also lost a family member, which is very sad and I completely understand. They start going to church again. Cam 
says that it's not really something her parents really did. They did it while she was growing up. They attended, you know, for Christmas and Easter. Everybody kind of looks down on those people coming from an ex-evangelical. They were just kind of those weekender people. Probably two, I want to say like two months after they start religiously going back to the church that her parents used to go to, uh, her Aunt Ruth decides this isn't good enough, it doesn't have a youth group, Cam's not getting the support she needs, so she uproots her and moves her to a mega church uh, in the next city over. And this is where the problems kind of really kick off with the religious guilt and the trauma regarding her sexuality. Throughout this whole time, Cam, ugh, poor thing, she just expresses relief that her parents are dead and they won't know that she kissed a girl. She is obviously very upset that they're dead, but her first instant reaction when she learns that they're dead is, oh god, thank you, because, you know, they will never learn about what I did, basically. Which is very sad, and I completely understand. The first time I kissed a girl, I had the same reaction. Like, my parents are gonna hate me. Yeah, so they moved to this mega church, and like a lot of mega churches, they go in on the sin and the guilt and the if you're not breathing the right way then you're going to hell kind of thing. I grew up very, I think I was Southern Baptist, so it was very much like hellfire and brimstone for me as well. And I saw a lot of that in the church that they end up joining. It's very our way or the highway kind of thing or our way or hell basically. And so her struggle with her sexuality progresses a lot more. It's it's very sad to see. I recognize a lot of myself in her, but we kind of do a time skip and it skips to when she's in high school or just starting high school. By this point, her parents have been dead for about three years now. She's kind of moved on. The mega church is kind of a daily, th not a daily thing, but like a weekly thing. She goes to their, um, I think it's called Firepower, is there, which is such a religious youth group thing to do. Mine was called Refuge. Shout out. Uh, take that out. Don't add that. She, it just kind of becomes like a normal thing. They go to church every single week, maybe multiple times a week. She's very involved in the youth group and she kind of makes friends with people in the youth group. Like a lot of her friends attend this youth group, one of which is Jamie, um, who is her best friend. And of course, Jamie and Cam get up to the normal kid things to do when you live in a small town and there's not a lot to do, which is drinking and breaking and entering. And it starts off with the last few days to the summer when they're, they're just kicking rocks around in this old abandoned hospital and they're drinking and Cam is kind of like reminiscing about when her parents died and about Irene because Irene has decided with her parents to go off to a boarding school and so she's not going to be around. Their relationship was really strained after her parents' death, obviously, and also because right after uh, her and Irene kissed, it was very hard for her to just like be in the same room and not like spiral a little bit. They they're just kicking around rocks being kids and stuff. This was a really nice scene because it kind of just showed like her relationship with uh, the people she like hung out with. It was very nice to see that. It's established that she does track as well as swim. Also, it she kind of has a flashback of uh, the summer as well. She's kind of like reminiscing through the summer as well. But she had done a bunch of swimming competitions over the summer and she'd met this girl named Lindsay. And Lindsay was from the West Coast and she was an out and proud lesbian and everybody knew it. Cam found herself just kind of enamored with her and they became like really fast friends and then they became a little bit of something else and Cam was having all these feelings about that and Lindsay was just like so out and like proud of herself and Cam kept thinking like I have to go home to my rural town. Lindsay gets to go to the west coast where like she brags all the time about like laying every single girl she wants and like being out and like she could just like go shirtless if she wanted to and you know paint herself in rainbows and like nobody gave a shit. Um, and Cam is very jealous of that because she can't even think of the word lesbian without like wanting to throw up, which is also very relatable. <laughs> But yeah, so they kind of have like a fling and she's coming off of this um, and like settling back into normal life and like doing her rowdy teenage things. I was not allowed to be a rowdy teenager. I was homeschooled. But yeah, so it's also established that one of the local smaller town high schools of the farming towns 
got shut down. It was a class of maybe like 12 kids total um, and the education system in that district of Montana decided it just wasn't worth it to have only 12 kids and they would redirect the funding elsewhere. So that, cla that class, um, that school got shut down and they moved on to Coley's high, Coley, oh my god, Cam's high school. Coley is the girl who Sam is introduced to. Cam. Cam is in okay. Cam is introduced to. Uh, Coley is the girl that Cam is introduced to and they become fast friends. Coley has a boyfriend named Brett who they are like the it couple even though they're freshmen they're like the it couple. Everybody's like making like comments about them everybody's obsessed with them so much so that um Coley gets nominated for prom queen that year even though she's a freshman. That's like a whole thing. It's, it's very set up very quickly that like Cam is straight. Cam is straight. Cam is a good little country girl. Her family owns a ranch out in the middle of nowhere and Cam falls head in love with her. Head over heels in love with her. <laughs> um, she is just completely enamored which I mean I don't blame her the way she was described. She sounds like a very beautiful young lady. She she just kind of like goes for it and she's very it's very nice because she is very respectful that Brett like is her boyfriend is Coley's boyfriend and they can't like do anything and also Lindsay is telling her like hey like don't go after straight girls it's just gonna be a problem which I think a lot of like newly budding sapphic people have that problem of like you know that's a really pretty straight girl. I personally didn't have that but my lovely fiance did with me because I was trying to convince everyone under the sun that I was straight. It doesn't lean into the predatory lesbian thing which is very nice because I feel like a lot of books kind of scapegoat with that, at least the ones that I've read, but it doesn't. She's very respectful of it and she doesn't do anything until Coley recipro reciprocates, which she does later on in the book. I guess we can just talk about that because I really don't no, I mean a lot happens in between, but I want you to read this book, so I'm not going to tell you everything. So Coley and Cam end up going to Coley's house. There's like this big weekend, or I think it's like a week. But it, I don't know, it felt like a weekend, but it's like this huge event. It's like a huge rodeo thing. There's this joke that like if you can't get laid during this weekend, like you just can't get laid. So Jamie, uh, who I brought up earlier, is... Cam's best friend and it's kind of let known that Jamie has a crush on her at one of the dances they attend he like makes a move on her and she just kind of reciprocates but it's very clear that like when she kissed Irene it was very different from when she kissed Jamie like she just didn't feel anything when she kissed Jamie it was just kind of like a thing to do but when she kissed Irene it was like not, I don't want to say like sparks exploding or anything, but it felt like it meant something. And so Jamie is just kind of being an asshole. He, they're up on a roof. I think they're up on the roof of the hospital, that like old abandoned hospital. And they're fooling around and he wants to go all the way and she just kind of like turns it off and she sits up and she puts her shirt back on and she's like, okay, let's go get like food and whatever. And he gets pissed. He is upset. He's like, I don't understand why you can't just like pretend to be straight. I don't understand why you're holding out on me. Like, God, you're so obvious that you are in love with Coley. Like, I, I can't believe the whole town doesn't know. He does, he, he does use some like words that are not very nice in referring to lesbians. It is a word that personally I have reclaimed, but I don't want to say it for fear of getting yelled at. So, I won't. He's just kind of being an asshole. And so she ends up going to the town where Coley's working in the like festival, going to the booth, and she's just like upset about it because she's convinced that Jamie's gonna tell everybody. Or like also he mentioned that it's like obvious to everyone and she's freaking out about that because if it were obvious to everyone, bad things would happen, she would go to hell like all this stuff, all the normal religious trauma stuff. So she goes and finds Coley and Brett, by the way, is on a two week vacation before school starts. Um, so it's just Coley, like usually they're attached to the hip, but it's just Coley right now. So it's Coley and Cam and they kind of hang out and Coley's like, hey, like, like I, I think it's 
her aunt actually who messages her and says hey I caught Jamie doing inappropriate things with a girl from a neighboring town over on the bleachers over by like the I think the rodeo area I want to say and like I just wanted it to come from someone that you knew and she's kind of like well we're not really together but that still sucks like it just kind of sucks that because I wouldn't put out for him he's gonna go find somebody that will so she's kind of upset about that and uh Coley's like hey like why don't you come over to my house we can have a sleepover it'll just be fun like it'll be fun and she's like yeah okay sounds good so they go off together and they go to her house and when they're out doing chores together because Coley lives on a ranch so her mom's like hey can you go feed all the animals Coley's like okay well Cam you'll have to come with me here where my brother's shit let's just go do this and they're like okay they end up stopping on the road back and they're just sitting in the bed of the truck like on the edge on like the part that like goes like you know I don't have a truck um, on the part that goes folds down they're just kind of talking about everything and nothing and then Coley is just like you're really obvious about me let me see if I can find it actually oh they're also drinking yeah they're also drinking don't drink and drive they're talking about sex um obviously they're teenagers but they're talking about how Jamie like got mad and went and like slept with another girl and Cole Coley's like oh Brett would never pressure me to do that we haven't done anything before and then uh Coley starts asking about Irene and like oh why did you stop uh hanging out together and our uh, Cam is like oh, well um when your parents die it kind of changes everything like admitting the fact that like they kissed and stuff like that because she doesn't really know how Coley's gonna react yeah and then also Cam says like offhand oh like I bet like like Coley's like oh what do you think they're doing right now and Cam is like oh she's making out with her hot polo playing boyfriend at the prep school um, and pretending to like it and Coley's like well why is she pretending to like it and Cam says uh, she's pretending because she'd rather be kissing a girl and then Coley gets scared and she says what Coley's like well how do you know how do you know that and Cam's like well how do you think I know bitch? like because we've kissed before um and then they kind of oh yeah and then Coley's like hey bitch, you are like totally in love with me I can see it and Kim is like no I'm not <laughs> no I'm not that's not true I'm not and Coley's like yes you are um why haven't you ever made a move and Kim's like well you have a boyfriend and you've like never said that you were interested in me like what what do you mean why haven't I done anything and then Coley kisses her Cam's like yes this is perfect this is amazing this is everything I've ever dreamed of and then she like pushes her off and Cam like falls out of the bed of the truck um and gets stuck in the mud and she's like stuck there and she's kind of like freaking out a little bit because she can't really read Coley she doesn't really understand like what Coley's feeling until Coley starts freaking out um, and she's like, well, I liked it. I can't, Coley is like, I liked it. I thought I would hate it, but I liked it. Like it has to mean something. And Cam is having a normal gay panic. And she's like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't have to mean anything. Like if it doesn't mean anything to you, then it doesn't have to mean anything. And Coley's like, yes, it does. I liked it. So therefore it has to mean something. This is a cycle that they kind of get stuck in together. Every single time they are intimate together, they kiss, they make out, whatever. Coley is very insistent that it has to mean something and Cam is very insistent that it doesn't have to mean anything and I just thought that was very interesting because um, I felt like I could kind of relate to Coley in the fact that when I first kissed my fiance I felt like oh god this has to like mean everything but yeah so that kind of becomes a trend they don't talk about it um and then they keep hanging out together and they keep like making out together and they're very sneaky about it they're just kind of sneaking around and then one day um Lindsay sends Cam a uh I think like an indie movie it's a David Bowie movie it's a vampire David Bowie movie so we know it's gay but yeah so they she watches it first and then there's like a really risque scene between two women that's like she's like it's basically pornography I've never seen the movie I feel like I should but she's like it's suggestive enough to basically be like lesbian pornography and so she texts Coley and she's like hey like, well she doesn't text because it's like the 90s but she tells Coley like hey we should watch this together and Coley's like well 
why? And she's like, no, you'll see, you'll see, it's okay, like, you'll see. So she goes to Coley's brother's, no, it's not his, her brother's house, um, Coley has her own apartment, uh, to make it easier for transport for school. Um, so she goes to Coley's house, um, or apartment, which she also shares with her brother when he's too drunk, because he has a habit of drinking and driving, so he will crash there if he's too drunk, which is important. But, so they go together, they're hanging out and watching this movie, and they're getting drunk on Malibu. The scene comes up, and Coley's like, oh, I see, like, I see why you wanted me to watch this with you. And Cam's like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. And then Coley's like, okay. And then the scene just kind of gets, like, more intense, and they react to it, and they end up in the bedroom. They have sex, and Coley is like uh, freaking out after a little bit doing the same song and dance like well that has to mean something and cam's like it doesn't have to mean anything like it really doesn't like we can just pretend like this never happened like it's okay and coley is very insistent that it does mean something and then she goes to reciprocate and her older brother drunk with two of his friends comes in the door and they have to like scramble to get ready and stuff and the next scene is very uncomfortable um, it was for me anyway, where it was just three really large drunk men being very suggestive with teenage girls, which was just gross. That happens. And while I think her brother's, her brother's name is Ty. While Ty is, you know, going around, he's being drunk with his friends. Um, he notices that Cam is just getting in, like frequently increasingly more anxious and like nervous and upset because Coley just won't look at her and like will not acknowledge her and is just freaking out about it and she just gets so upset that she leaves and and Ty is like no I can drive you home and she's like no like you're drunk I'm gonna drive me home even though she's a little tipsy do not drink and drive but so she goes home and the whole way home, she is just thinking about like, well, that was a disaster. Um, that could have gone a million times better than it did. So I'm just going to do my best to um, pretend it never happened. Um, but by the next morning, she's like, no, like this meant something. Like, finally, I am acknowledging this meant something to me. And she's like, I'm going to write uh, Coley a letter. I'm going to tell her about how I feel and how like it's just destiny that we have to be together. And then she goes downstairs. Her Aunt Ruth calls her downstairs and she goes downstairs and waiting for her are the pastor of the mega church. I think also the pastor of the Protestant church that she used to go to and her aunt. They're like, you need to sit down. So she sits down and she She's um, also a kleptomaniac. She steals a lot. So she's thinking that, you know, she got caught at the drugstore and, you know, she's like thinking of all these things like, oh, I just, I was going to go pay for it. I just didn't have the money. Like, I didn't even notice. So she's just like thinking of all those things. And then they drop the bomb of Coley told her mother that you took advantage of her and led her to sexual perversion and temptation and are a homosexual. I hate that word. So we're intervening on your behalf, basically. And the only thing Cam can really think is they know. And like her life just kind of comes crashing down around her. And she sits through this, you know, telling there had been a youth pastor who came to do um, a sermon a couple weeks before at their church who was a I don't even want to say it like it's gross it, it he he was homosexual he is I guess but he through the power of Jesus Christ he was reformed so he was a reformed homosexual and he came to speak about the camp or like it's a school actually it seems like a camp it's so disorganized but this school this Christian Academy and Reformation camp that he constructed um, because of his own journey. Uh, it is conversion therapy. That is all it is. It is just conversion therapy. But he came to talk about it the week before and he left some pamphlets. And her aunt has one of these pamphlets and is like, we've already paid the tuition. We've already signed you up. You're leaving. Uh, this next school year, you, this is where you're going to be. Um, and if we don't see any major change, you are not coming home until you have graduated high school. Cam is just freaking out, which rightfully so. I would also freak out. Yeah, so the conversion therapy... The conversion therapy place 
um, is named God's Promise Christian School and Center for Healing, or Promise, they call it for short. So she's packed up. Um, her life is just kind of like, she has no privacy anymore. So every single thing she owns is just kind of thrown away. Like if her aunt decides it's not permitted, or if this pamphlet that she has been given states that for some unbeknownst reason, it, it tempts her to sin or temptation or something like that. Like everything is thrown away. This poor girl has nothing but like the clothes on her back. And not even then because then she gets a uniform and she can't even wear her regular clothes. But yeah, she her life is packed up and she's sent off to this camp. I keep saying camp. It's, it's a school. I, I use the word school very lightly um, because basically their only schooling is very similar to the homeschooling that I was brought up in where you were given the work that you had to do and that was it. You had to do it by yourself and if it was state mandated and it passed enough you were considered to be graduated. There was really no help that they were offered. That's all I'm going to say about that right now. So she shipped off to this school. She is very, I'll talk about this more later, but she is very surprisingly composed. I would have been ripping the doors off of that freaking car on the way there. I would have been dragging my heels and like sticking signs out the windows to get somebody's attention. Like I would have been off my rocker, but she handles it very well. She's very angry and very upset, very rightfully so, but she handles herself um, at least until her Aunt Ruth leaves um, and she gives her a hug and tells her like this is the best thing for you if your parents were still alive this is what they would have done for you and Cam just loses her shit. I mean I completely understand because her parents died when she was 12 like she has no idea what they would have even thought of her even just kissing Irene like she has no idea and neither does her Aunt Ruth so that was a very baseless claim to make but yeah she just goes off she's like you don't know my parents like you they would never do this to me like I hope you feel better about yourself doing this. And her aunt is very upset and she leaves crying. Um, I didn't feel very bad for her. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she meets um, two, the two people who are the most important to her are um, Adam and Jane. Jane is a paraplegic. Uh, she lost one of her legs in an accident. And uh, so she's got a... Uh, mobility aid. I think she's got a cane as well as a um, prosthetic. Uh, the prosthetic is important. I mentioned that for a reason. And then Adam, who is Lakota, he's indigenous and he is two-spirited. He had a word for it, but I, I will, I will put it up on the screen. I will not try to say it because I don't know how to say it and I don't want to say it wrong. But he was two-spirited, is how he described it. To, to what he said, to my understanding of his interpretation of it, um, I've done a little bit of research on it, on uh, two-spirited indigenous individuals as well. Um, it is not my place to talk about it. I am agender. I do not have the right to identify as anything like that. Um, I am a white person. We've done enough colonization. I'm not stealing their words either. But yeah, so he described it as, you know, his, his gender identity is very fluid and he is no less woman than he is man. Um, but he uses he him pronouns, at least in this, in Promise, in this place. And they just become like fast friends. And part of the reason they become fast friends is because Jane grows weed on the outskirts of the property and they all just go light up together. Um, and the reason I brought up her prosthetic is because um, she has like this little indent in it or like this little compartment in it that she uses to store the weed so that like nobody knows about it, which I thought was very clever. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they become fast friends and these people just together, this is really their only way of surviving together. These are the only people they really have for each other. I don't want to talk about it a lot. The conversion therapy they do is, they do it more so than the education because it is one-on-one -on -one sessions with two highly untrained in any sort of mental health reformity at all. And conversion therapy is not mental health reform. It, because being gay or being transgender or being anything that is not straight and straight and white basically and cisgendered is not a disease. It is not a mental illness. It is not. But they don't, they just use psychological buzzwords, like therapy buzzwords almost, to make themselves sound better. But they use the Bible a lot um, in everything. And their main focus is on the perversions of your past, basically. Cam is given a 
picture in the very beginning. It's a photocopied picture of a drawing that the pre what is his name? I don't. E I didn't like him enough to know his. I think it's Rick. Is his name? Yeah, Rick. Um, he was the pastor who came and spoke about being um, a reformed homosexual. This is his camp. And he runs up with his Aunt Lydia, who is a, a monster of a woman. I hate this woman. R it's Rick's drawing, and it's a photocopied version of his drawing, and it's an iceberg. Um, and it's a lot like the Titanic, um, almost. I know it's in poor taste to bring that up right now. Um, but it's very much, it's like this huge iceberg, and here's the water, and then here is like the huge part of the iceberg beneath the water, and then there's like this little tiny boat. And they make her write friends, family, society above the boat to indicate that's what that is. And above the iceberg, she has to write her lesser sins in regards to her homosexuality. So she does. I mean, what are you going to do? You're there. You have to comply. She's not allowed to decorate her room. She's not allowed to be alone. Um, she's not allowed to get any outside communication from anybody. Um, so she's just isolated. And in order to get any of her privileges, um, she has to do all of these things. And also, I would probably in her situation do the same thing um, if it meant that I had the possibility of getting the hell out of there at the end of the school year. And so she does it and it was just like the these people, um, Rick and his aunt, the way they do it is just so perverse. Um, it's so invasive. They make her talk about every single aspect of her childhood. Like they relegate her parents dying to her like trauma that triggered her to be gay like the fact that she kissed Irene and then her parents died it was like a cosmic atrocity and a punishment for her doing that um, and then just like all of these all of the things leading up everything that made her who she is it was just basically taking everything that made her as a person and telling her why it was wrong and making her write it down and like indoctrinating it into her like she even talks about that like a couple months in like it becomes a part of her like she doesn't want to buy into it but because she is being hounded by it every single day in either one-on-one -on -one group session or one-on-one -on -one sessions or group sessions with all of these other kids like she's like it's just so hard I can't not separate myself from it and not like despise myself a little bit from it which that was so sad I there's a photocopy version of hers in here um and also everybody has to have them out on display their icebergs out on display for everyone to see their sin their sexual sin and their regular sin to hold them accountable but I really think it was just a shame tactic used to force good behavior or model behavior that they wanted to see there is a it, it kind of relates there is a saying strict parents make sneaky kids and it very much gave the vibe of that because they would play nice during their sessions and then you know her and Adam and Jane would go and get high in the barn you know when nobody was watching and nobody really ever caught them which was a good thing I think Jane got caught once um, but she was also she's been there for a long time so but yeah so as it progresses they're able to go home for two weeks for Christmas and she is bitter. She is so bitter and angry and I completely understand. I, I understand all of it. Like how could you not? This poor girl has been forced away from everything and been told that every single thing that makes her up into the person that she is. She's like 16, 17 in this. Your brain's not done developing until you're 25 and you're being told that literally every single innate part of you is wrong and has made you be a terrible person. Like no wonder she's bitter. But yeah, so she goes home and her Aunt Ruth is getting married. Originally the wedding had been set for a couple of weeks before she was shipped off, but she pushed it and Cam tried to tell her before she left, just get married without me. And Aunt Ruth was like, no, I want you there. And it seemed very much like a punishment almost. And so she's kind of, she's not told so much as commanded that the wedding is going to be on Christmas Eve and she will be there um, and they get into an argument where she's like I will not be your your maid of honor because she was set up to be the maid of honor. She's like I will not be your maid of honor I will attend and that is all you get from me um, and that's exactly what happens. They have a wedding 
and she attends and she sees every single because it's in the church she sees every everybody and she the whole time going home and being there she was just thinking about what would I say to Coley like what would I say to like get back at her what would I say to make her hurt as much as I do or to make her understand what she's done and she just never gets the chance and she's also just like when when she does have the chance I should say she just kind of doesn't take it she's like you know what nothing I ever I say will ever change her mind it's very it, it's a very real thing to realize that after the wedding she plays nice she tries to get along with her grandma um, her grandma is very homophobic, um, but she's trying to put that aside to just connect with her granddaughter and she's like, are they treating you well there? And Cam is just like, you know what? They treat me fine. Like, I'm not starving. I'm not sleeping outside. Like, all in all, they treat me fine. Because her grandma was not a safe person to tell the horrors of what was happening to her psychologically. So... On one of the last days she's there, her Aunt Ruth is still mad at her for not being a the maid of honor at her wedding. So she sits Cam down and is like, I haven't seen enough improvement in you. I'm not convinced you're not gay anymore. So not only will you be finishing this semester, you will also be going to the summer camp. And after that, if I decide that you still aren't improved enough, you're going to be going to that following school year as well. And Cam's just like, great, I'll probably just die there. <laughs> but yeah, so she goes back and the vibe around it, it, like when she does go back after after the holidays, everybody's just really somber. Everybody's just sad um, because, you know, they, they went back to their homes and all of them, if if not, well, I mean, I would say probably a good majority of them were told like, that's not good enough, like, you're not doing good enough, you're all staying for the summer camp, like, they were just ostracized, you know? And one kid, his name is Mark, his father was, is a, um, a pastor. He's a pastor. I think in Mississippi or something like that. He's in the South. But yeah, so he comes back and this poor kid, I don't even think he's gay. I think the reason he's there is because his dad caught him playing a David Bowie song or something or his hair got too long. Like it was a ridiculous reason why. There was just like a little series of reasons and his dad was like absolutely not like my I will not have a gay son. You're going to this you know reformation center and um that's that. But every single he's been the the promise um the conversion therapy center has only been established for three years and this poor kid has been there every single semester as well as every single summer. He has hardly been home. His name is Mark and he during one of their group sessions he goes off the rails. He is so upset because when he went home his father told him like you will never be good enough. No matter how hard you try you will never be good enough because you are damaged in my eyes. And this poor kid was beaten down by his father and then sent back to this place to be beaten down even, even further and he just loses it. He has a mental breakdown in the middle of one of their group sessions and is inconsolable and then afterwards he's just catatonic. He does not speak to anyone. He does not do anything. He just lays in his bed. And Rick, the man who runs the place and his aunt, leave him alone um, at night and um, he hurts himself uh, very badly. I won't go into detail on that, but he hurts himself very badly and um, is sent to a hospital. And through this, the only thing Rick and his aunt do is just, it's so blasé. It, it, it made me so mad because they went to every single person and had a one-on-one -on -one with them about like, oh, how are you feeling? Blah, blah, blah. And like, Cam got so mad. She's like, admit it, you don't know what you're doing here. Like, you're just like hurting kids and, and like hoping it sticks, basically. And he has nothing to say to that. He's like, well, I believe that, I believe in what we're doing. I believe that God knows what we're doing. And she's like, no, screw that. Like, no, absolutely not. You don't know what you're doing because you're only 
response to him being like this was to leave him alone with access to things that could hurt him. And like this poor kid is never going to be the same again. Like he could have, he could have done worse, you know, he could not be here anymore. Um, and, and Rick doesn't have an answer for her. And she's just kind of like, okay, I need to get out of here. Um, and so she goes to Jane and Adam and they kind of concoct like a like a plan while they're smoking together like okay we're gonna leave we're gonna get out of here like we're gonna go and so they spend a lot of time getting on everyone's good side they do what they're supposed to they stay away from each other so that it's like not suspicious cam really leans heavily into giving um the directors of this program what they want like she just says whatever makes them feel good and whatever they want to hear and through it she's like for me, it's not explicitly explicitly said, but I could kind of tell it was just kind of like a like an out of body experience almost. Um, which I mean, it, it has to be. You're othering yourself for the sake of someone else. They end up getting getting everything together, and they do end up running away, and it is successful, which was incredible. I really loved how it ended. I I really thought that it was very good because they they kind of took back their autonomy. Okay, apparently this only records for an hour, um, which is annoying. But anyway, so yeah, they run away. Um, they take as many things with them as they need and they run off and they make it pretty far. And the ending is very hopeful. It was very nice. Um, they go to the place where Cameron's parents died and um, it's just very... It was a very nice ending. I I was very worried when she got sent off to conversion therapy because it was a good, I want to say like halfway through the book. It was a good like halfway through the book. Um, and I was very worried um, about her and <laughs> where she would end up, but I'm very glad that um, they, they made it out, all three of them. I'm very glad for that. Um, but yeah, that's The Miseducation of Cameron Post. <laughs> I don't like the uh, Goodreads version of rating things. I think reviews are very subjective, um, which I know is the point of Goodreads. I know. I know. But I don't like the one through five stars personally. I just, I don't feel like it fits. But I would say it was, it was very high up on my list of things to read, especially if you have religious trauma, I would say. Um, it was very healing. Like, I'm past the point of needing to see myself in in a character and be like oh other people experience this too I'm more I'm an adult now I I'm more in the place of I need somebody to put it into words so I don't have to and I think it did both it, it very well set up Cameron to be a very relatable character a, a very nuanced character a very morally gray character who is thrust into a black and white scenario it was it was incredibly done um, I, I highly recommend you read it, but I want to talk about some of the themes in the book that I would like to expand on personally, um, with just like my personal opinions, um, and stuff like that. I don't really want to go into the conversion therapy stuff. Um, it makes me very uncomfortable to talk about because it was a very, uh, realistic thing that could have happened to me. I could have very easily been sent away to conversion therapy. So I don't really want to go into that very much. I will just say that there are no conclusive like studies that are non-biased that prove that conversion therapy works. Um, in fact, they prove the opposite. The rates of certain things are a lot higher for uh, LGBTQ people who do go through this. So I I do recommend you do your own research on it. Um, it is very important for everybody to just be aware of it, especially with all the leg legislation in the United States right now and where everything is going. I really think we're going to see a resurgence in it very soon. Um, and I personally will not stand for that. Um, so if it does happen, you can bet your bottom dollar I will be all over that and we'll be advocating against it. But yeah, so I want to go into the religious guilt aspect of it as well. What was very interesting to me was that Cam was religious. I say religious, she was just kind of aware of God in the way that a community who you have been around a very long time is aware of, you know, God, if that is the main religion in your area. Um, and to my understanding, the area was very predominantly white. It was very predominantly working class and the church is really 
ran a lot of the legislation and stuff like that. So she grew up in this system, but it didn't seem to be, I don't want to say as much as a pro of a problem, but it didn't seem to be a, like it just, it just wasn't as big until her Aunt Ruth came. Um, her Aunt Ruth was a born again Christian who really bought into the very extreme parts of it. Um, the very extreme parts of it. So much as I would say, I, I saw a lot of myself in Cam in that youth group of how polarizing it was. Like if you, if, if you didn't conform to it, you were the other, um, you were wrong. Uh, people would corner you in the halls for counsel and stuff like that. Like I really saw a lot of myself in her in that. Something that was very interesting to me was as much as she adopted the views of the religion and like internalized it, like she didn't adopt it, her Aunt Ruth adopted it, but as much as she internalized it, she never bought into God. Um, she never really sought the Christian version of God out. Like it was more the idea of hell that really got her. I grew up in the church. Um, I... I wouldn't say I had a relationship with God. I mean, I, I mean, I guess I would. I guess I would. I don't anymore. I think I'm just biased because I don't anymore. But for her, it felt very transactional in the sense of like, I do this wrong. Like transactional in the sense of like making a return and having a negative amount of money. I used to work for a small business. Um, and if we had somebody come in before we had sold anything in, uh, that day, um, we would have negative amount of money for the day. And it felt very much like that. Like, she had nothing and then they took it away from her <laughs> even more. She just was like giving reserves she didn't have. That was just very interesting to me. It just hit home for me, I think. Um, another thing that stuck out to me too was just the nuance of um, her relationship with her family, um, especially after she was sent away to Promise. She never outright said she hated her aunt or her grandma or Coley even for doing this to her. She never outright stated it, but you know, it was, it was like, I would have, I would, I know I would have, and I would have outright said it and I would have no told them and I like, I would have made it known. But I don't know. She just like held space for them, I guess. Like she, she was upset and she was angry and she was hurt, but she never outright stated she hated them. And an example of this, I guess, is um, while she's away at Promise, her aunt has a condition where she has a lot of tumors on her body that she gets surgically removed every few years. And one of them, the biopsy came back and it was cancerous. So her aunt had cancer. And uh, so she was in a bigger city with her grandma getting that cancerous mass removed as well as getting some radiation. And Cam's thoughts on that weren't what mine would have been of good, you deserve it, like I hope it's painful. It was, it was more like she was worried about her grandma being uncomfortable in the hospital chairs or the hospital room by herself. Um, and she like she didn't really have a lot of thoughts towards Ruth, but she did have a lot of thoughts towards her grandma of just like, I hope she's okay. She's even allowed to make a phone call to them and just like check on them, which I thought was really nice. But yeah, that is the miseducation of Cameron Post. I would love to hear your thoughts about it. Um, I have religious trauma. So things like this, I just really love because it explores it in ways that either I have thought about and I just haven't been able to put into words or I haven't thought about and it just kind of gives me something to think about. Um, this was definitely a book that I read in, I mean, I read a little bit of it and then I put it down um, and then I picked it back up again and I finished it. It's, how many pages is this one? This one's from the library and it's a paperback. Um, this book, this version of it is 470 pages. So I probably got through like 150 pages and then... I sat down and I like, you know, I was, I was done in a couple of hours. It was so good. It was so hard to put down, but it definitely was one of those books where I had to take a few days to just think about it, um, and process it, which is something that I try to do with all of my books, but I really love it when books like trigger me to do that, I guess. Like there, it really doesn't hold space for me to do anything else, which is very nice. And, and this definitely did that for me. Yeah, another thing I want to do, um, so for each book that I read, I would like to find a song that I think goes with it. Um, I was a dancer for about 15 years, so music is something that I really connect to. I don't know, I just think 
every book deserves its own song. <laughs> um, so the one that I came up with for this is um, Follow Your Arrow by Casey Musgraves. Um, I also used to be into country music when I was younger and that was the first country song where, you know, somebody didn't really make a big deal out of like doing your own thing and like kissing girls and stuff like that. And I won't say it necessarily reflects the book, um, but I do think that the, it gives the similar vibe. Like the tone of the song is very similar to the tone of the book, if that makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> Girls who get it, get it. <laughs> and I also want to feature a small business that I have found. Comment below any small businesses that you might have found that may retain to it. I'm trying to stay to queer artists um, or queer creators. Um, however, there are a couple of books that I have coming up where I have some Asian American creators, some black owned creators, uh, stuff like that. I, I just want to make sure that I'm including people that are not just cis and white and straight. Um, because that's the default right now and I don't like that. Um, but yeah, so the, the shop that I found is um, Stater Graphics on Etsy. I'll link them down below as well as put somewhere over here, Tegan. I'll put it somewhere. Um, but they have t-shirts um, for relatively affordable prices um, and it does seem like they include uh, queer people in religion. Like it's, it's, You'll see what I mean. It's very nice. I'll try and do a screen grab of it. But yeah, thank you for coming along with me. Um, it was a pleasure having you. Feel free to subscribe. If not, cool. Um, it's nice having you.